about five minutes into the hour, um, I think we're, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and I'm Brad Burkhardt. I'm sort of your pilot uh, for uh, today's event and I try to keep the plane, you know, steady uh, and make sure everything uh, works beautifully. So uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, welcome to the energy of abundance. Stop struggling with money and live your purpose. Uh, Dan, this might be a good uh, time for you to take, take it away and uh, let's, uh, let's enjoy the conversation that uh, you and Jennifer have, have planned for us. Uh, thank you, Brad. And first of all, I wanna welcome everyone. It's clear from the chat messages, there's people from all over the world, uh, all over the United States. It's really fantastic to have your interest and your excitement about this. You know, Jennifer and I have been <clears throat> discussing this for, for a while. And when Jennifer and I met not that long ago, we found out synchronistically that we have exactly the same views on abundance. And that our journeys, although we come from very different backgrounds, are very, very similar in terms of the things we've gone through and the things we've learned. And so that's why we decided to put together this little workshop and the ones to follow to share our experiences, our successes with you. The third thing I'm going to note <clears throat> before asking Jennifer to jump in is that it's important to realize that sometimes on our journey towards abundance, we struggle, right? We end up very poor. Most of us know that. But sometimes when you think that people are successful, and Jennifer and I each are successful and abundant in our own lives now, but Jennifer and I each had periods of deep struggle and deep poverty and we turned it around. It's part of the journey. So I don't want you to think coming into this that somehow I was born with a lot of money or Jennifer was, or you know, we just got lucky. It wasn't like that at all. It was our work and our attention to our journey and our healing that has led us to very abundant lives right now. And I think you know this in your own practices, but we'll, we'll be talking about that. Jennifer, uh, you were excited to do this course and why was that? Why, did, why were you so keen on this? I love this topic for multiple reasons. One is that I know a lot of people that are struggling with money and would love some assistance. And um, I feel like to empower people to get over their struggle and to create a better life just really excites me just because I know what it feels like to, uh, to not be able to do what you want to do or not be able to serve the people you want to serve because you don't have the money to do so, or to feel really stressed out about your money situation. And uh, since I've done all of that, I've been really stressed out. I've felt frustrated with my lack of funding. I've felt all these emotions. I've been angry at the universe and, and I want to help people through all of this and, and claim their, yeah, I can do this too. I can, go create the, the home environment I want and I can fund my mission. And I just wanted to help people feel empowered around this arena. And uh, with Quantum Touch, you know, a lot of people have felt empowered around their health. They've healed themselves. Well, they, they get this power going with the energy and they have trouble applying it to, to finance. And so that's what excites me is like, how can we use this energy with, um, quantum touch or other modalities and apply it to our money. Yeah, that's the irony, isn't it, Jennifer, that a lot of people on the call today are energy healers or have own, you do their own energy work or maybe even their own energy practice. But a lot of them are still trying to figure out how does that translate to business and marketing and all those other things. I think what happens to those of us in the healing professions and, you know, one of my jobs is I'm a life coach is we go into the zone we use our energy skills when we're with a client or a patient, and then we forget about it and we sort of contract when we go out to the rest of the world. And it's that contracting that I think really screws us up. When we're in high flow, we're expansive. But when we contract, we're tiny and nothing's flowing. And perhaps the thing that I stumbled on early in my career was I began to understand step by step, money is energy. You know, money's neutral. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that was the root of all evil. It's a greed and fear that we put into money that makes it toxic, not money itself. And so money in our culture anyway is a lot of the ways we measure our worth and our self-worth, which is just disastrous, right? Abundance is so much more than money, right? It's a lifestyle. It's a way of being. And in fact, even more importantly, it's a way of feeling. And we hope to transmit that feeling to you 
uh, because Jennifer and I have learned, you know, not everything about abundance, but a certain amount of it in our personal and professional lives. Yeah, and, and the, the interesting part is um, right now, uh, due to the circumstances around COVID, um, I think many people have seen a drop off in their income. And the tools that we want to teach and that we want to express um, can help, you know, sometimes you're, you're getting into that abundance and then, you know, something like COVID happens and you're like, oh no, now what? Well, you can still use these tools to, to keep on to, you know, retain your power and to continue to turn it around. And um, that's what I'm excited about too. It's not just, okay, now I'm abundant and everything stops. It's like the abundance is still, it, it's a continual practice. And for me, that's the fun part is that you can have that practice. Now you can apply it to any situation, including a global pandemic and a global recession. And, and I think you and I are both doing that during these tough times for people. You mentioned something to me there that they asked you what the most important thing you wanted to communicate today was. And you said the victim mentality. Could you expand on that? Why is that crucial to abundance? Well, I think one of the problems that I used to have was I, I had a beef with the law of attraction. And uh, my beef was, is that I was doing all the mantras and I felt like I was doing everything right. And I felt like, okay, I'm following my heart. And so where's the money? You know, I'm trying to help others and there's no money. Like what's going on? And um, I felt like I felt angry at the universe because I thought, okay, you do what you love and you're supposed to be abundant and that's just automatic. And, um, and in that anger, I felt like a victim, I felt like a martyr for my cause. I felt like I'm doing all these things and I'm not abundant and I feel that the universe doesn't love me or it doesn't support me or it doesn't want me to do my mission. And um, I was feeling like a victim. And I think a lot of times if we do a deep dive into our situations or our issues, there's a bit of victim mentality that, that tends to come up. And whether or not you feel like a victim to you know, your relationship or you feel like a victim to your money situation, um, or you feel like the law of attraction is only 80% and there's such a thing as random, randomness in the universe, all of that um, can be processed because as soon as you step into that victim consciousness, you're uh, in the antithesis of abundance. I don't know if you've noticed that, Dan, but that's what I've noticed. Yeah, it matches my experience, Jennifer. I would say that I became an expert in self-pity. That was my version of victimhood. Um, and I hope it doesn't happen to happen for everybody, but it seems to be part of the journey for many of us that we're in a very much a blaming mode, the universe, others, our parents, whatever. Um, and the truth of the matter is we create our own reality. And I know that's hard for some people to accept, especially when their reality is difficult or sucks. Um, but I think it is the truth. And maybe the simplest way to think about that is at a minimum, we create our own reality, or at least our own reaction to reality, wherever that may be. I had to own my own sense of despair, my own sense of victimhood, my own sense of self-pity. And I was really good, I think, to say I got a PhD in self-pity. Of course, it didn't help me be abundant and it wasn't leading to a very happy life. So I had to crawl my way out of that pit an inch at a time, but it can be done. You know, the opposite of self-pity is gratitude. And I try to live a life now full of gratitude for everything, including even the so-called difficult moments. And I know that that can be hard, and I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it can be done because gratitude is actually also a vibration and a tone and a feeling, just like the negative vibrations and tones and feelings are. So, you know, the other context I want to paint here is that the reason you and I are experiencing an abundant universe is because we believe that it's a co-creative abundant universe. If you believe that it's a nasty, mean universe or world out there, it will be an experience of a nasty, mean world out there. And I don't mean we don't all have challenges, obviously we do. I mean that how we approach it defines ultimately what's going to happen for us. I had a huge wake up call and it wasn't under a, you know, in a Buddhist monastery or anything like that. I had a wake up call in the back of a police car around being a victim 
and I'll uh, we'll cover that a little later on. But um, I realized through my process that we create 100% of our reality. And I know that I struggled with that for a long time because I thought some things are just so horrible. How can you say we are responsible for that? I think a lot of people struggle with that as far as the law of attraction is, can we take responsibility for 100% of our reality? And it's kind of a double-edged sword because once you start taking responsibility for everything, there's certain things you may not want to take responsibility for. And I've felt like that many times in my life. Well, wow, I don't want to take responsibility for this. This, How could I possibly create this? And a lot of my own journey was coming to terms with the law of attraction and understanding that, yes, I, I do create everything. And I, I don't know if how many people feel like that's really hard. I know I, I really felt that that's really hard to do. But on the other side, once I did um, my work to take responsibility, I felt much more empowered, even when quote unquote, let's say negative things happen. And I believe that you can use everything either as a tool to uh, get your PhD in self-pity, as Dan said, or you can use everything in your life as a tool for growth and expansion. And uh, that's, that's where really I've been, you know, going in my life is saying when, when less than optimal things happen, what can I change within myself and, and create a different reality? Because uh, the reality is a reflection of our own vibrational frequency. And with the energy work, you know, we can understand what vibrational frequency is. And then we can go ahead and say, how do we shift it? And I feel a lot of that comes through processing everything in our lives processing the emotions and releasing the story. I don't know if Dan, that's any comment on that. Jennifer, I completely agree with you. It matches my experience and not only from myself, but from my coaching clients. The truth of the matter is, is that negative energy does have its own vibration pattern. And in a fractal universe, if you're holding a lot of negative energy or unhealed places in your body or your psyche, it will project itself into your reality, whether you want it to or not. I call it instant karma, okay? And so I had to, you know, I still spend time healing and, and working on what am I projecting into the universe. And that doesn't mean that people aren't accountable for their own behaviors. It simply means I'm accountable for my own state of being and my you know, tone and quality of my vibrational reality. And of course, what I find is the more I pay attention to that in my own healing and my own honesty and inner truth, the easier life gets in the material reality around me. Yeah. Um, so I have a process that I'll just share briefly um, and I'll, we can delve into this a little more is um, how many people out there feel, uh, let's say, triggered on a maybe even a daily basis by something? <laughs> okay. Right. Um, I, I believe that these triggers, like let's say your partner does something, you're like, you know, stop that or, you know, or, um, you know, your, your bank account triggers you on a daily basis or, you know, COVID is triggering, you know. Um, what I like to do is these triggers, I believe, are an insight into what vibrational frequency we're projecting. These are an insight into what's in the way of manifesting what we want to manifest. So I do two things with triggers that I just like to share. The first thing I do with the trigger is instead of going to the refrigerator, which I used to do in the past, or, or dive into my bar of chocolate, um, I sit with the, with the feeling. Now, Michael Signer, in his book, um, The Untethered Soul, I don't know how many people are familiar with that book. It's a wonderful book because he describes a process called relax and release. So instead of trying to push away the feeling, like breathe into the trigger. So if you're angry, breathe into that anger with the intent to release it. Or if you're hurt, breathe into that hurt with the intent to release it. Once you know, I get neutral around that feeling and I'm ready, I try to get into, well, what story 
am I running that creates that feeling? And I look at to where did that story get started? So for example, if I'm uh, angry at you know, something my partner did, I process the feelings until I'm neutral. And then I think, wow, what, I'm running a story of, well, I don't deserve love or whatever story that's underneath it. And I've come to the conclusion that our stories, these things that really build our psyche and that build our energy, they're, they're neither true nor false. That so what do you mean big, by that, Jennifer? That's interesting. That was a big realization for me. Yeah. So the universe to me is really fluid, meaning that it'll reflect back to you whatever stories that are within your being rather than some uh, logical you know, process. The universe isn't like a logical entity. Um, it reflects back to you what other stories you're running. So it's really, really fluid. And it's interesting, like when you deal with partners too, like your stories will collide. I don't know, Dan, you've had experience about that, but your stories seem to, you create the perfect environment to trigger each other's stories um, for, the, for ultimately the release is what I believe. And so you can recognize uh, something like, wow, I don't believe I deserve love which seems to come down to what's at the root of a lot of our stories. Um, recognizing that that's not true. And that's not false. It's, it's just your belief system. And so every time I'm triggered, instead of getting all you know, frustrated and, and wanting to go bury the feelings, I believe these triggers are an opportunity to rewrite our stories. And, uh, and as we rewrite the stories, things change in our external reality without having to change people. Because I used to try to change people, but I realized that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, I uh, had a couple of marriages like that, Jennifer, and that didn't work. I completely agree with your, your commentary. What I hear you saying is that the universe is a neutral, reflexive, refractive uh, kind of uh, entity or energy. And what's very interesting about that is, who am I going to blame? If the universe is just reflecting, you know, my own journey or my own thoughts or my own feelings or my own, my own vibrations. Now, the good news is, if the universe is reflecting, it can amplify the good parts of my journey and the positive parts of my thoughts and my feelings. And amplification in co-creation with the universe, I think, is critical. Just like the universe can amplify negative feelings. Okay, you can look at things that are happening around the world right now to see that that can be true, but it can amplify positive feelings. Another thing you raised a couple of weeks ago when we were prepping for this was the whole concept of intentionality. I wondered if you wanted to comment on why you think intentionality is important in abundance. So I believe that we're all manifesting all the time. Like our energy is attracting into our lives what we're a match for. And so without um, intentionality, I feel like we just randomly, you know, create whatever is the result of our energy projection. And um, whereas when you have an intention and a goal, um, the universe then understands like where you'd like to be. And so your whole ship starts steering towards that goal. And sometimes that's, I think like that's the hardest part about manifestation is trying to figure out what you want or what you desire to create. That's, that's sometimes where I struggle. Yeah, it's called gaining clarity, right? And it takes some work. Just a, just a sidebar on what you're saying there. I think we're always manifesting, but usually unconsciously. So therefore, when we have negative beliefs about ourselves or others or, or, or the world or, or circumstances, we're projecting those and it is manifesting. So if I'm walking around thinking unconsciously about, you know, a story, one of those negative stories, if I've got 10 or 12 negative stories out there, they're very active in manifesting negative realities, which then, of course, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I thought it was a nasty universe, and now I know it's a nasty universe because that person was nasty to me or, or they ripped me off or whatever the circumstance is. And, you know, the, the flip side of this, as you said a few minutes ago, is to rewrite those stories. What I tend to do with myself and with my clients is say when they have a negative story, write all your negative stories down. 
and then create a column that says, what are the positive versions, the polar opposites? Right? In other words, the question is always for me and for others, what am I trying to teach myself? I'm having a negative experience with another or a circumstance or my own being. What's the point here? It's not, it's not pointless. This is not a pointless universe. This is a universe full of meaning and full of learning if we let it be. So even the so-called fears and the so-called pain and the so-called negative things, and they all happen, I don't mean they're not, don't feel real, can be transformed. They can be opportunities. You implied a few minutes ago walking into those fears, accepting them for what they are. And I found that to be very effective, very difficult, but very effective. Most people try to use denial as a methodology without knowing it. No, I'm not scared. No, I'm not afraid. No, I'm not angry. No, I'm not pissed off. You know, whatever it is, it's all sort of denial. And of course, denial is a, is a terrible strategy. Whatever presents itself is there, is there for a reason, usually for an opportunity to transform it, which is clearly what you've done with a number of the circumstances in your life. Yeah, uh, another thing, another story that I wanted to bring up that applies to money that I've followed and not followed, and I've been annoyed by this story. The story that you have to sacrifice your well being or your health or your relationships or your time to, to uh, get ahead or, or become abundant. A lot of the financial advice out there that, that I love a lot of the financial advice out there, but sometimes some of that advice says, well, you just really need to get a second job to pay off your debt, go deliver pizza after your full-time eight hour job, or you need to uh, cut your budget you know, in half and stop buying organic food or enjoying life and just pay down your debt. And uh, you know, I mean, that advice works. You know, people get out of debt doing that. They save money, they, they pay off their homes, they get out of debt, but I feel like I don't like it. I mean, how many people like that concept? I, I don't, I mean, <laughs> so that was one of the stories that I was running is that you need to work really hard and it needs to be really linear. It's all about running you know, a budget and following a budget. And so um, the alternative to this is to realize what I've been realizing more so lately is that the universe is so fluid that you don't need to use logic all the time. Logic really sometimes works. Yeah. I mean, logic works, but we've been experiencing some things over here in our universe with my business partner where money is showing up without the use of logic or reason. I have the same experience, Jennifer. You know, what you're describing is the transactional approach to money, do this, A, B, A, and then B. The problem with it is, is there's no soul or spirit in it, and people usually won't sustain it because it's not alive for them. It's just a series of rules that if you discipline yourself to follow, yeah, you can change the formula of your debt or your income versus your expenses. That's absolutely true. But there's no vibrancy to that. There's no life to it. There's no reality. Therefore, for most of us, it's not very sustainable. We kind of do it for a while. You know, it's kind of like going on a diet. Yeah, as long as you're on the diet kind of thing, as opposed to understanding why you may be eating poorly. They're two different things. And so, you know, for me, as I mentioned earlier, I understand money is energy now. I never did for years because our culture doesn't teach us that. Money is just meant to be a means of exchange. It's really quite neutral, like you're describing some aspects of the universe. And money is just a measurement of an exchange. Abundance is much more than money. You know, abundance is opening every cell in our body and every part of our neural pathways to openness, to discovery, to creativity and invention. Abundance is a feeling. Abundance is a tone in the body right, that carries through to moments in relationships and business transactions. Etc. I'll give you an example. So I've been involved helping people build a number of buildings in the real estate world, which is a pretty vicious environment when you get into real estate, you know, commercial construction and big buildings, in my case for wellness centers and schools and things like that. But I insisted that all the developers and real estate people involved be completely transparent, open book, all the numbers right in front for everybody, including the owners and the public. 
and the developers freaked out at first. They were like, what? I don't do that. How can I do that? And I said, well, those are the terms, but we're not going to hire you otherwise. And they all had to go through this journey of getting over the story that they couldn't do that. It was bad. And then they did that and it was good. And the projects were good and, and the owners were happy and the buildings have good energy in them. So we were taking a traditional sort of, you know, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. You're not going to know what my barges are or aren't, right? And it just changed the relationships all the way down the line in a pretty tough transactional business. That was purely my intentionality, the intentionality of others that were working with me to build these buildings with an open heart, uh, which can be done. And I also want to, you know, mention related to that, people think about things like best business practices as nasty and dirty and mean like marketing or budgeting or whatever. Yeah, if you approach them in a contracted linear way, they are kind of um, disdainful. But if you approach them differently, they feel different. The best example I can give you is inner marketing. I've built my coaching practice over the last 15, 20 years without a website, without a business card, simply by going into the inner planes and attracting my clients energetically and using my energy skills to say, who can I serve and who can I serve well? And that relates to your sort of talk about the money shows up, abundance shows up when you're in your highest flow. And I can always measure whether I'm in a high flow or a low flow, if synchronicities are occurring or not. I take synchronicities as a measurement of high flow. Yes, that, yes, as people are asking, what's the alternative to budgets? I see some of the chats coming through. And uh, I mean, I've done that. I've torn up my credit card and the next day I taped it back together with duct tape. Because <laughs> I can't follow, I have no discipline to follow a budget. I recognize that about myself. So I never really wanted to do that. Um, but I'll give you an example of what I did do. This is an exercise that might be helpful. I took my bank statement, my, you know, my credit card statement or my bank statement, you know, where all my transactions come out, both, you know, personally and professional. I took my bank statement and I felt into every transaction. I opened my heart and felt into that transaction and I rated it. I said, did I receive value from this and equivalent to the money I spent? So this was my way of doing a budget. It was feeling into what, what was real for me. And I looked at a lot of my bank statement and said, you know, there's a lot of transactions on here that I didn't feel equivalent value. There are some things on here that I spent money on that I never used. Like why? Yeah, that's a really interesting approach. The only the business plan that I first did for my coaching practice, I painted it. I actually took a piece of paper and a bunch of colors and I went into my zone. I just imagined my clients and I just painted it. And after I finished it, I looked at it, I said, oh, I could put an X, Y graph on that and that could become a business plan. These are completely different approaches to, I think what happens when people hear the word business or marketing or money, their sphincters contract, they get really tight and they just like go out of their natural flow people on this call all have some place in their life where they have natural flow. It could be healing practice, but they're a healing practitioner. It could be sports, could be making love, could be anything they want, could be in nature. There's all moments where we know our body feels alive and in harmony. And the question and the challenge becomes, well, wait a minute, if you know the taste of that, how do you apply that to all areas of your life, including money, including relationships, including so-called business. There's another comment I want to make about that. I actually experience our businesses and our projects and organizations as living energies, they're living beings. And when I do that, I get into a co-creative relationship with the energy behind my practice or my business instead of thinking it's mine. And then what happens is the syntax changes. Instead of saying, what should I do next? I ask a different question, which is what wants to emerge which is a co-creative question. So I wonder what you think about the idea that a business or an entity could be living. Yes, I, uh, with quantum touch, um, the question that I now ask the business on a regular basis is what would you like? 
because I, I believe it's not about me. It's about the collective energy of everyone involved in this business and that we're all co-creating it. Like every, every person, every teacher, every employee, everyone involved is a co-creative process. And the energy of this entity, let's say a family or this entity wants the highest good of everyone involved, including, you know, people working for us. You know, sometimes a lot of work environments are employer versus employee. Yeah. And it's like the needs of the employee are kind of counter the needs to the business. And I think that's an old paradigm way of thinking because now you, you know, you have to motivate your employees or you have to, you know, f yeah, you know, with, you know, uh, discipline or whatever. But I think when it becomes a co-creative process and the business guides and everyone involved in the business guides, then all the needs of everyone's wants and desires all co-create the highest good. And as the leader, what you do is you need to listen to what everyone wants to co-create with the business and then do your best to facilitate it. So I think it's really for the people rather than business versus customer or business versus employee. So, yeah. and, and the same, you know, same with your bank account, that exercise I talked about, it isn't, you know, money versus what you want. Like that's, it's a typical mentality is that, well, I can either have money or I can go buy what I want, but you know, they're not, they're mutually exclusive is kind of the mentality that a budget is a restrictive thing. And when you do like what I call the authentic budget, when you look at your bank account with, you know, do these things have value for me? It's like a co-creation of your spending aligning with your authentic self and the highest good. And that's where I look at it now. Yeah. And, and by the way, that last comment is crucial, at least in my experience, Jennifer. If you're trying to get money or relationships or success just for your own ego personal needs, eh, that's going to be a, a, you know, a short journey because you said for the highest good, right? There's a lot of people that know how to use intentionality or the law of attraction to get money or make profit, usually at the expense of everybody else, right? or anybody around them or their family members or so-called competitors. They just step on anybody and everybody should succeed. And those people that have values higher than that say, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not gonna be a bastard to rip off people to succeed. So I guess they can't succeed. Well, what we're trying to do is change that story and say, look, you don't have to be uh, that kind of person or that kind of organization to succeed. That isn't really success. You can be committed to your world service, to the higher good, and enter into that co-creative relationship with your colleagues, with the energy behind your business and with the universe itself. And that's a completely different story than a zero sum game of it's all competitive and, you know, and, and the toughest guy or gal wins, right? We're changing the story back to how nature is teaching us. If, you know, if people have trouble understanding these concepts, I just invite you to observe more deeply how nature works. Nature unto herself in our incredible planet is entirely collaborative and entirely co-creative. The old Darwinian story that it's just the competition for the best isn't, isn't quite whole. Darwin wasn't quite right about that. There's actually huge, huge levels of collaboration and symbiosis throughout the entire natural universe. And I think it's long since past time for humanity to learn from the earth itself. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot, what has turned a lot of people off to abundance or money is the idea that you have to exploit others to get it. Yeah. I mean, and, how could that really be abundance, right? Right. Because now you have that energy of everyone you exploited uh, surrounding your abundance. And that model still happens. I mean, we see that all the time. And I think all our light workers out there who care about our fellow humans that that really turns us off to the idea of having a million million dollars or or you know having a lot of money because we view it's a win lose situation yeah i mean it's really you've said this in your book and in our conversations it's such an extraordinarily abundant universe if you can allow yourself to believe that to be possible and true because that contradicts the story in our western culture that it's a competitive as i said zero sum game where what I get, you can't have. That's not actually my experience. My experience is actually when I am feeling 
my action from the heart of my own center, my own being, based on love and based on positive energy, everybody benefits, not just me, not just my family, everybody benefits, you know, and, and that's hard for people because the cultural memes are so strong about competition and go get them and he was better than he and she and all that. But really, if you're not abundant right now, why keep believing stories that tell you that it's a competitive universe when that's not serving you? It's a story that was given to us by mass culture, perhaps by our families. If it doesn't serve you, we need to change those stories. Hey, uh, Dan and Jennifer, um, chiming in here. We're about 40 minutes into the hour, and I'm seeing a, a lot of questions and comments uh, showing up in the chat. And I know we wanted to leave some time to kind of um, address some of those questions. And I'm also seeing a lot of uh, experience and wisdom uh, come through in this chat uh, mm -hmm. uh, column as well. So there's a, there's sort of a a, a group, uh, you know, sort of biofield that's happening here, a lot of sharing that's going on around this conversation. But uh, I think this might be a good time, uh, Anna, if you've been kind of monitoring that and um, uh, pulling some uh, some questions or comments out that we might want to uh, bring to the front and, and share with the audience uh, so that Dan and Jennifer can uh, comment. Uh, I think now might be a good time to do that. So we have uh, a little bit of time to maybe go through three or four different questions and so forth. Um, Anna? Sure. Why don't you uh, why don't you uh, uh, pull some things out and share it with the crowd and Dan and Jennifer? Um, let's hear what you have to say. Okay. Yeah, that's that's chat was very active. Has been very active and people had some uh, technical problems, but also uh, asking some questions, but also some were uh, answering questions. There was a, a very active, so that's, that was interesting to watch. But there's some question that uh, I may summarize and. Uh, this popping up. So first was, uh, uh, how law of attraction works with accidents, like breaking your leg? Jennifer, you want to try that? Sure. So accidents or tragic things. This is a really hard one with the law of attraction. My recommendation on this is that the first thing to do is to process your feelings around let's say the tragic event or the heartbreaking thing or the accident until you're ready to look at the cause of creation one of the worst things you can do to somebody is when they're in the midst of heartbreak or grief say well why did you create that i've had coaches do that and i, I don't appreciate that because really when you're dealing with the, the gist of emotions to to process and then to look at well, what role did I play in this creation? And that's something that you can ask the universe. It's different for everyone. Sometimes accidents bring up emotions that were long buried from the past, uh, old childhood wounds that never got healed, or maybe um, more recent situations where there was unprocessed emotion that was just stored in your energy. So really to me, it's about the accident is an opportunity to process the emotions that come up and heal the stories around it. But that's something that's very individual. Well, I certainly agree with that tone of what Jennifer's saying. Honor, did you want to ask another question? Sure. So that's another question. Uh, I live with someone who is negative and complains com constantly. How do I quit uh, these to affect me? And it's just a family member, so it's not a love relationship. So that was I, um, clarified. I saw that in chat, and you know, it's a tough situation because it's you don't always get to choose who you live with with their family member. Mm -hmm. But I've been through that experience, and I guess what I would say is this: uh, it, we need to create sacred boundaries in our own being. We need to have enough sense of our own energy and our own space, emotionally and psychologically, so their negativity does not come in to our own bodies and to our own being where we take it and own it and it can make us sick psychologically or, or physically. So there's a way to observe people and be attached from them and still be compassionate but not take on their negative stories. It does take practice. It is hard with your living with someone. If I was again in that circumstance, I would do what I did before. I found a lot of time 
away from that person a lot of time outside of the house where I cultivated my own boundaries. Okay. Another question, uh, how exactly do you, uh, do you attract more abundance? And there is a lot of questions about abundance and transforming from negativity into abundance and uh, living good, uh, vibrant relationships. So that's kind of summarizes a um, series of questions. Well, you know, I mentioned early on, for those that might not have heard it, that Jennifer and I have each had serious moments of poverty, lots of debt and, you know, not much food, et cetera, et cetera. And we worked our way out of that. Well, we didn't work our way out of that with a magic wand or a rich uncle, right? We worked out our way out of it by changing our attitudes and our perspectives. I would argue strenuously, even if people don't quite get it or agree with me, that if you're experiencing a lack of abundance, it's because there's something in you that needs to be healed and needs to be opened up and understood. Certainly that was true for me. There were many stories that I had that were very negative about lack of self-worth, how the universe did or didn't work, uh, other people, et cetera. And I had to delve into those stories and transform them to allow abundance to flow into my life. So my answer to that question, at least in a short you know, conversation today, is obviously many more layers to it we'll get into in future courses, is attend to your own being and start opening up what part of your journey is ready to be healed. And I wanted to add, if you're looking for a daily practice, daily steps, there's a couple of, of things I'll, I'll just cover briefly. One is to set your intents. I know a lot of people that want to be abundant, but they don't really have a, a goal or intent other than I, I want to stop struggling, but set a positive intent. The other practice that I feel like is very important on a daily basis is some of the stuff I briefly mentioned about processing your stories. So once you set an intent, either what you want to manifest comes to fruition or the universe will show you what's in the way. And I believe the universe shows you what's in the way through your daily triggers, showing you what things are unhealed within yourself by every day you can understand what's not healed within yourself by what you're triggered about. And so then it's about processing those triggers and then tracing them back to the stories that you're running. So the universe is constantly giving you clues as to why you're not attracting what you want. And it's just, and they come, I believe they come a lot in the form of what you get triggered by. Yeah, Jennifer, I agree with that. You know, it, it I would say that it's a universe full of purpose and meaning. And we all need protagonists and we all need challenges. I don't believe we actually grow without them. So they may be irritating, they may be dangerous, they may be even very, very difficult or onerous. We've all had, unfortunately, usually even some tragedies in our lives. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of tragedies. I'm simply saying when tragedies or even minor problems arise, what is your attitude? I'm always asking myself, what is my attitude? I had an experience healthcare wise a decade or so ago in which I was near death. And I had to deal with the impossible tragedy of dying within a matter of months. Uh, and I decided that if death was imminent, it was gonna be my next great adventure. And that shifted everything for me. And I recovered from that near death experience and I've never been healthier since. It was about my attitude, not necessarily the thing that was happening with the so-called disease in my body. So I'm just challenging ourselves and all of us. And, and by the way, the wisdom on the chat that people are sharing with one another is wonderful. Thank you so much for that. It's really, really beautiful to see. And as we get into future courses, I hope that wisdom sustains because we're going to be able to have more time together and, and hear from all of you, if not, or certainly many of you. So really what I'm saying is attitude is everything. And your attitude can shift even your own physical health and certainly the abundance of your own reality. Most of uh, other questions is uh, actually just uh, go around uh, go around this uh, the same. How do we do it? What the meditation? What this? Uh, uh, what techniques uh, for shifting to this? Uh, okay, to abundance. So, so let me let me build on that. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. 
as I said earlier, I want to pick up on this. Almost everybody I've ever met has some moments of high flow in their life. And if you're an energy healer, you know that. Uh, if you're not an energy healer, you still have. It could be music, it could be sports, it could be something. And I invite everyone who's participating today to think about the feeling. Feel into your body about moments of high flow. I have a couple of clients who are surfers, right? And there's a really important moment for them in which they're just on the right wave at the right time, going into the barrel, as they call it. And if we have moments of high flow, we have this opportunity to unpack, well, what am I doing? What permissions am I giving myself? What stories am I letting go of? One surfer I remember thought he was living in a very competitive, nasty universe. And I said, well, when you're on the board and you're one with the ocean, is that a nasty competitive universe? He said, no, but that's surfing. I said, well, wait a minute. If it exists in surfing, it could exist anywhere. So we use that to unpack that moment of high flow for him, for him to start to learn how to take high flow to other areas of his life. If you have glimpses, even just glimpses of high flow in your life, or if you're lucky enough and blessed enough and have earned the right to have lots of high flow in your life, you can apply that to any part of your life if you can begin to understand what you're really allowing to take place. And Jennifer, you may want to comment on this too. Um, yeah, I believe that this relates uh, to a question I just, I just saw right now. Uh, I receive, uh, I have patterns that people take money from me and never return to me. How to break this pattern. So as, as Dan said, a, a state of high flow involves a state of gratitude and beliefs that the universe is on your side. Whereas when you have a pattern of people stealing from you, what I believe is there's a story behind this. And so the first step is to release and process the feelings. Because as long as you have those uh, feelings, like let's say you're angry, let's say either at the universe or at the other people, that anger will hold that pattern into place. So if you can first release the anger that you're feeling as a result of people stealing from you, that's the first step with the intent to forgive. Now, I know that's really hard when it seems like life is unfair. Forgiveness of, well, these people didn't treat me well, why should I forgive them? But really what you're forgiving is the part within you that attracted that. And by doing the forgiveness process, um, you create, you, you're releasing that pattern of energy. And it's not saying that their behavior is okay. It's forgiveness is about releasing the pattern of energy that creates that situation in, in the first place. And I've done that. I remember when I, you know, first started to generate some significant capital in my life. I was very proud of it. And it was kind of an ego thing. And I was like, yeah, you know, I've got a whole bunch of money now and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and then I did exactly what the person in chat, I think, is implying, which was I lent somebody $10,000. And it was for them to do something to help in their life and get blah, blah, blah. And I never got a penny of that money back. The person ripped me off. They stole it from me. But when I actually looked into what was my motivation, it was my pride. Yeah, I've got this money and I'll help you because you're struggling. And it was patronizing that attitude. And it was all kinds of my own crap in that. It was not a generous sort of freely given, yes, here's a loan, but here's our terms. I had energy on it, it was bound up in my own ego needs, and it bit me in the behind and it served me right. And it was a really good lesson. So be careful, you know, when you lend money or you give money or your pride is even involved in your abundance, it will have instant karma on it. I guess the other thing I want to say is that you have, we have to make life decisions. I mean, fundamental life decisions about whether or not we're going to allow ourselves to be content and happy. I don't mean Disney, la, 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 happy. I mean, just a deep sense of contentment and fulfillment in our life. And it's a fundamentally existential question. Are you going to allow yourself to figure out how to be happy as defined by what we're talking about, not by how many cars or boyfriends or girlfriends you have or a house, just at a fundamentally car. And you said early on, and I wanted to go back to Jennifer just as we wrap up here, that higher purpose is crucial in abundance. 
And what do you want to expand, expand on that for our participants? Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it manifests in two ways. One was when I was talking about my spending habits. When I was spending more of the money than I made, that was due to ego. I wanted to seem like I was abundant, but it was really at the expense of debt. And a lot of the stuff I spent money on really didn't have any value for me. It didn't serve any higher purpose. It was inauthentic. So with our personal spending, we can use that concept of aligning our spending with our, our true authentic self. And I noticed after I did that financial bank statement exercise, I naturally cut my spending almost, you know, I guess at least in half, if not more, without any suffering or feeling like I was following a budget. The other thing about the higher purpose is that, sure, you can make lots of money doing something that you don't love, but then you have all this money and you're doing something that, that doesn't make your heart sing. So that was where I feel like the higher purpose really comes into play because I think it's wonderful to make money doing what you love. It, it serves you, it serves the universe. And uh, that's really an important piece of abundance. Thank you, Jennifer. And I find the same thing as my intentions, my higher purpose. I'm clear now about my higher purpose. And it's very easy to be abundant, at least in my experience, when, you, uh, when you're clear about that. Brad, I know you wanted to comment on what's coming up next for people. Um, yeah. So perhaps we'll leave it there and turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're um, kind of five minutes to the end of the, the program here, and we did want to uh, take a few minutes to talk about what we're doing from here. We have uh, some courses that we're going to be offering in the weeks to come. And if you're an energy practitioner, business or life coach, or someone on a, on a path to learning energy skills, and uh, these may be of interest. And essentially, these course programs are going to be much more intimate. Uh, they're going to be much more interactive. Uh, it's going to be uh, uh, conversational among the, all the participants, not just the speakers, uh, as in the case with a kind of a webinar uh, type presentation. Uh, and we will uh, really be going uh, deeply into the seven major uh, themes under the energy of abundance uh, sort of uh, topic that we've just been really uh, talking about as an, a sort of an introduction today. Uh, the first course is a, is a single two hour program uh, that's uh, scheduled for Tuesday, September 22nd from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, and again, uh, we will be going uh, not only deeper into the, uh, some of the themes introduced uh, today, but um, uh, themes that we really didn't even have a chance to touch on today. Uh, and that will be in, a, in, in an environment where you'll be able to raise your hand and ask a question, be seen and heard, and uh, really um, have, get, have an opportunity to get to know uh, not only the speakers a little bit better, but everybody that's, that's in that group. Uh, and then... Uh, shortly after that, we've got a, a course series, uh, which is a seven-week, 14-hour series of learning events that begins on Tuesday, October 13th, and it continues a weekly uh, every Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Pacific time through November 24th. And just to um, uh, touch on those themes, you know, we, we kind of, uh, you know, just scratch the surface of a few of them, but um, it, from your higher purpose abundance versus scarcity, your business as a living being, intentionality and goal setting, uh, and, you know, techniques and tactics and personal experience that uh, will be shared not only by uh, Dan and Jennifer, but hopefully by uh, some of you as well. The art of inner marketing, uh, cash flows, energy, and business tools as energy skills. And again, sometimes, you know, uh, particularly artists, creatives, energy healers, uh, Sometimes there's a, a, a tendency to feel like doing business and marketing yourself and selling is not aligned with uh, your authentic self. But uh, as Dan and Jennifer have kind of teed up, uh, that's not necessarily the case. It's really just a matter of attitude and approach uh, and, and understanding um, uh, techniques. These sessions are a way for Jennifer and Dan and all of uh, the participants to connect uh, and to connect deeper into the topics uh, that are introduced in the course programs. We're offering an a early bird discount. So for any of you who might uh, want to uh, look into signing up for these courses, we will be sending an email out uh, shortly after this webinar. You will receive uh, a 40% discount off the pricing uh, for uh, signups that happen uh, essentially by the you know, midnight tomorrow night. 
and uh, the pricing on the two hour uh, course is uh, normally 100, so that'll be uh, offered for 60, and the pricing for the seven week, 14 hour uh, series of courses is um, uh, 620 regular price, so that'll be uh, available for 375 for signups again made by um, essentially uh, midnight tomorrow. And then beyond uh, the sort of the early bird discount, uh, pretty much everybody on this uh, in this group uh, is uh, was invited through Quantum Touch's email list. And though there are some of you who found us in other ways through the event by uh, channels or what have you, we are offering a Quantum Touch affiliate discount of 20% no matter when you sign up, up to the day of the course. So we will uh, be offering that discount to everybody in this group. Uh, as well, so uh, some some discounts on those courses. And again, we uh, we do have your email addresses from your sign up on the Eventbrite uh, page for this webinar. Uh, so we will be sharing the details and links, um, including links to the Facebook page where uh, Jen, uh, Jennifer and Dan will be answering uh, many. Uh, in fact, we'll try to address all the questions that were answered in this chat. It's a long list. I've been seeing this thing scrolling uh, through the whole meeting. So there's a bit of homework for us to do. But we will get to that and we will share a link to the Facebook page where we will try our best to address everybody's comments and questions uh, later And Brad, on. There, is a, there is a replay for people. Uh, and there is a replay. In fact, this webinar is being recorded, so we will also uh, share the link to that. And we encourage you to share all of this with uh, any colleagues or friends, family men or members, anybody you think uh, might be interested in the subject matter. I just appreciate everyone attending today. This is a topic I really love. I've learned so much about myself by attracting more money. So really money was a tool um, and still is a tool for spiritual growth. So I hope that you guys can uh, continue to, to uh, enjoy some of our courses and keep this topic and this discussion going. Cause it's just such a wonderful, amazing um, process that I've been through and uh, I just love it. So. Dan, if you have anything else to share. Yes, uh, thank you to all the participants. The wisdom, as I said earlier, on the chat is quite lovely and helpful for everyone. Uh, we have a lot more to share with you. This was just a kind of a taste of it. And um, like Jennifer, I love this topic. It's a really important topic, I think, for, for most of us. We'd love to see you again in the future. Thank you so much. <music>